Um, thank you as well to Dr. Hegarty and to the Thomas More Institute and to UCA for giving me the chance to come here and to think a little bit about today with you about conscience, which is, I'm going to suggest, central to the sort of democracy that the European Union and the Council of Europe have attempted to develop in the past 25 years. I want to explore the issue of conscience on a secular and a legal basis, and then perhaps to suggest some practical ways in which the law in Europe and in European member states might well embody a doctrine of conscience as a protection for freedom and free speech. I suppose I should start by concentrating for a few moments on what we mean by conscience. I don't pr propose to base my arguments on religion. I think that there is a clash between the spiritual and the secular, uh, m mainly in the newspapers these days, not so much in the law courts. But uh, at least consciously, I think, we should instead try to look at what we mean by conscience in action. What we mean when someone says that they could not do a thing or that they were compelled to do a thing because of their conscience and how this connects to the fabric of democracy. I would like to explore with you the possibility that a workable idea of conscience can inform our assessment of Europe. And for instance, I'd like to try and resolve some questions with you. Like, can a whistleblower, a person who indicates that bad things are happening, in a public or private organization that's greater than him or herself, rely upon conscience as a defense to actions that might see them lose their job or their liberty or their life? Can an individual challenge a government or a law on the basis of conscience? Conscience, it would seem to me, is deeply intertwined with the idea that in freedom we're called to listen to an understanding of what's right, to check it against our culture, and to integrate those two, even if the powerful require otherwise. The question for citizens of Europe is can we rely on the recognition and protection of conscience under the law. Before I can address any of these issues, I must obviously address the issue of what I mean by conscience. I've said that I don't want to base things on faith, and I mean it, but it is impossible to avoid the observation that the term emerges and is often used as a Christian one. It is the New Testament's uh, synedesis that gives rise to the idea that one might suffer pain if one goes against moral principles, against the requirements of what one knows to be right. Actually, though, the exposition, the explanation of conscience like that is uh, not much help to us as citizens because the greatest proponent of the idea, St. Thomas Aquinas, is quite clear that people still get things wrong through ignorance or the muddied passions that produce mistakes. Most people act on the basis of a mix of emotion and personal calculation as well as reason. In such circumstances, people might well be driven by a feeling of guilt that had more to do with desires and fears or with the values of their perceived community than with reasoned points on which we could agree. A conscience that was based purely on one person's morality could not be a legal argument in court because moralities these days are different. In the sense that I've just mentioned, that sort of conscience would be indistinguishable from prejudice. Allowing for conscientious objection to legal behavior, to contractual points, to what the powerful are doing, couldn't form a proportionate or rational use of state or corporate time if it was based on prejudice. Because everybody would be objecting to everything and everybody would be seeking to be a hero or a martyr to a cause. Conscience is probably better seen as something relating to integrity than to morality. That is to say, it represents the integration of the individual's needs and wishes and reason with common reason and with our understanding of our behavior. What follows is simple. The group should not ask people to do things which demand the disintegration of their being. One should not oneself do things that one knows to be a product more of desire and sense, 
and one instead should struggle for balance between needs and wants and desires and reason and duty. And when one is absolutely sure that one cannot do a thing because it is against reason and against feeling, then one should at least be protected in the explanation of that. It is somehow wrong and morally destructive to treat people as though they could suppress different parts of themselves, as though they must always obey, and as though disobedience in itself is wrong. At this point, some of you might be thinking about the views of Professors Dawkins or Pinker that my depiction of conscience is essentially one rooted in something left over from kinship groups, from families, or an elaboration of our need to look after the group in order to look after ourselves. Tempting as it might be to jump in and talk about Professor Dawkins and Professor Pinker and their views of conscience, I'd just like to remind you of my remit. I don't want to refer to views of morality overly today. I want to talk about the law. I want to talk about practical applications of conscience. And I don't want to talk too much about human nature. I'm not here to argue that we're innately good and that conscience expresses that. I'll leave that sort of metaphysical, quasi-religious thinking to Professor Richard Dawkins. However, I would like to make just one final reference before we get into things to a philosopher some of you may have heard of, Eric Fromm. Early in his career, Fromm followed Marx and Rousseau in believing that conscience was about self-interest and should be discounted. It shouldn't have anything to do with people's behavior in a group. Like many philosophers, however, he underwent a change of heart as he grew older. Fromm began to embrace conscience at the same time as he began to walk away from traditional Marxism. He saw conscience as integrating a human being back into themselves and away from alienation, away from being abandoned in a world of abandoned people. In that context, Fromm tried to recast conscience as a word for love of life, love for life, and love for care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge, which was essential to living in a free country. For our practical purposes, it would matter if we lived in a Europe that allowed ourselves to respect ourselves and the environment, which allowed ourselves to take responsibility for things and protected us when we did, and which did not include areas where knowledge was forbidden or excluded for fear of the consequences. The practical iteration of that sort of conscience is freedom of information, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and freedom to dissent. This view of conscience to which I'm stumbling this morning, I think, comes practically close to the ideas which have emerged in different guises in debates in the past 25 years on what the public sphere should be. For Jürgen Habermas and Joseph Ratzinger in their public debate, for instance, a pluralist society, a society with lots of different groups, requires respect for the idea that the other person might really mean what they say. It's a radical idea in politics and economics these days, but it is possible that we could have the courtesy to believe that somehow people don't agree with us. That's uh, called an invitation to, the f to a fight in my native Ireland or politics everywhere else. It is possible to make a courteous attempt to understand and credit the personal integrity of another. It follows that if we were asked as citizens to do things that crushed or damaged another, or their views, or which sought to disintegrate them, we absolutely should refuse to do so. Now this gives rise to all sorts of complications. In the French debate on the public display of Islamic clothing, people did not fall back on the doctrine of laicite, on the doctrine of secularism, when they were searching for ways to justify telling other people what the minimum expectation of clothing was. They fell back on the idea of reciprocity. Reciprocity meant a duty to accord to another the minimum elements necessary to allow democratic expression to exist. A duty to show people what you think honestly in the belief that they will tell you what they think honestly. 
Now, for some people, this meant that covering yourself, hiding yourself, or being hidden was anti-democratic. But from another point of view, a minimum trust in another that they would have a conscience just like you had would mean that the other should be exposed to your expression. Reciprocity became the idea that we trust each other's expressions, we look at each other, we fill a space of communication between each other. And the iteration of that was that if any of us put on a mask or a helmet or decided to deny others the truth of what we believed, that that was somehow undermining democracy. Courtesy was put out and hidden and confused meanings came in. That seems to me to be a good way to, do, to discuss feelings in a totalitarian society too, where everything might have a third or a fourth meaning, where everybody has to hide what they say, where conscience becomes something that is a public act because you have to trust the other person and trust that they will not betray you. And trust is inevitably compromised in such circumstances. For those of you who know European and constitutional law, and I don't propose to invade Dr. Beck's territory, because he has a much more distinguished and informed opinion than I, there are guiding concepts we use in the European Union to identify whether somebody has behaved in an appropriate way. We ask, have they behaved rationally? Have they behaved proportionately? Have they behaved reasonably? Has a power or a decision maker behaved within the limits granted to them? Does it agree with what they should be doing? But I think we should add another question too, which is one I'm stumbling towards, and that is, do the people who object to this display of power deserve to be protected because they genuinely thought that what was going on was wrong? And is it necessary to protect them in all circumstances? Well, there are a few examples where we can explore this idea. My first target would be one you weren't perhaps expecting. That would be the one relating to the exact protection of whistleblowing. Whistleblowing is where people object to and expose what they think is wrong. The record of the modern United States, which talks a lot about this, is not good in this regard. Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, and Julian Assange are hardly poster children for the State Department's toleration of conscientious objection. Do we, as Europeans, protect whistleblowers? Well, in 2013, Transparency International surveyed 27 member states of the European Union to establish whether or not those who felt the need to disclose or report wrongdoing could be said to be encouraged, inhibited, or protected. They defined wrongdoing as a category that includes breaches of legal obligations, corruption, criminal activity, miscarriages of justice, dangers to public health or the environment, the abuse of authority, the unauthorized use of public funds or property, gross waste or mismanagement, or conflicts of interest. Again, something some of you might prefer to use in shorthand as politics, government, or football. What Transparency International uncovered was very interesting. Only four European countries, Luxembourg, Romania, Slovenia, and the United Kingdom, incorporated strong legal frameworks for whistleblower protection into law. Sixteen countries had partial legal protection for people who came forward for reasons of conscience. Seven had no or little protection at all for people who objected to the policies of their employer or their government. The last seven were neither small, nor concentrated, nor produced in any one area of Europe. They included states as far apart as Finland and Greece, Lithuania and Spain, Bulgaria, Portugal, and Slovakia. In addition, all but two of the 27 countries had ratified the UN Convention Against Corruption, which required whistleblower protection, but that meant that most had not done anything about it. Although the UK was seen as having the most advanced public interest disclosure protection, which covered almost all employees and effectively prevented employers from taking action against them, I wouldn't suggest that that then meant that the UK was the most honest state in Europe. 
uh, the recent history of the BBC, the NHS, the City of London, or what appears to be the entire political establishment in the 1970s and 80s, would perhaps encourage some humility in that regard. In fact, many times our whistleblower protection involves listening to what whistleblowers have to say and then failing to act upon it. My friends who will forgive me for saying it, in the Financial Conduct Authority, who spend some of their time telling people that they know what's going on but won't do too much about it in case nobody else ever comes forward. And so the Financial Conduct Authority, in a very British way, knows what's happening in the city. The city knows what's happening in the city. We know what's happening in the city. But nobody's doing anything about what's happening in the city in three quarters of the cases. Nevertheless, it's of interest to a seminar like this that basic legal protections for those who believe a company, government, or individual is doing something unconscionable are not in place in the majority of European states. Quite apart from anything else, such a lack of protection for the interposition of common values between the individual and the state is troubling. As Laura Underkuffler has noted when writing of the situation in the United States, Conscience is something which the law should at least allow a legal avenue to protect. You should be able to raise it in court and say, I shouldn't have been sacked or persecuted or pursued because I had a conscientious objection. In essence, conscience in this form is a compulsion that defies the state's power. It illustrates that democracy is based on the individual because it places the individual's consent to behavior, their reasoned understanding of what they are being asked to do in a protected space. It upholds our social capital in doing so because we can trust each other in those circumstances and it creates a common bond. And this is where reciprocity comes in as an idea. Democracy is not a set of administrative procedures nor some sort of Marvel Comics style adherence to an ideal. To work, it has to be based on trust, and part of the definition of trust is that we understand what's right, and if we do what's right, the wrong thing will stop and we will be protected. The reciprocity of social relations, in which I trust that you will not do something bad to me alone or in a group, and I will not act against you, is essential to our consent to work together in a society, and to vote, and to believe in our states. If neither you nor I were protected, everything would become politics of the worst kind. It would become social competition. It would become the accumulation of capital against each other. A sort of Hobbesian, nasty, self-protecting competition that we would be forced to play. And it wouldn't be very efficient either. As Torch and Valenzuela note in the European Journal of Social Theory, social capital is a public good. Its benefits are appropriated by all, they're taken by all, and they're distributed to all. So if we trust each other more, if we believe that we'll be protected in our consciences more, we can work better together and build more. Psychological studies have shown that closed social communities are ones in which there is close observation and monitoring of norms between individuals through the use of sanctions and rewards. Now, even in London, let alone the entire European Union, we're not in a closed community in that sense. But the lesson of social media and of investigative media and of freedom of information is that we can have an idea that there is something that connects all of us and that we can have social capital and that the way to communicate wrongdoing should be the media and social networks outside of the fear of punishment. And why would people communicate their resistance to badness ultimately if not for conscience? This idea connects reasonably well with Hannah Arendt's idea that citizenship in Europe after 1945, let alone 1989, to be meaningful had to be based on two separate structures. One was the idea of a space of appearance and communication where people could feel free to talk to each other. This was a place where opinions could be shared and where the expectation was that people would be persuaded. 
The other was the idea of a permanent world of social structures which produced stability and protected values. And conscience would be the bridge between the two. This is broadly the basis, one assumes, for the recent activity of the European Commission in seeking a Europe-wide protection for those who wish to object on conscience grounds. Like many organizations, the Commission has its problems. I'm sure Dr. Beck will tell you about those in greater detail. Uh, it hasn't, I think I'm right in saying, put forward any uh, accounts for the past 14 years, and 10 years ago had something of a scandal with its own whistleblowers. But in July last year, Emily O'Reilly, the EU ombudsman, opened investigations into nine European institutions that hadn't created a regime of protection for those who were troubled by what they were asked to do. And this covered things like not telling the truth in Euro negotiations, the policy towards migration, policy about accounts, relationships with uh, those who are not in the European Union, and day-to-day -day spending. Ms. O'Reilly's investigation is ongoing. If her distinguished career as an ombudsman in Ireland is anything to go by, it would seem to me that she would seek to place protection of the whistleblower alongside the protection of freedom of information in the EU. All of which gives us another question this morning. If a society is committed to democracy, as meaning something more than just voting, and it enjoys substantial freedom of information, do we still need to protect whistleblowers in every circumstance above the efficiency of public institutions? Can't we trust the complaints procedures of public institutions and corporations? I think this sort of problem becomes very evident when the conscience leads professionals and office holders into positions when they can't do their jobs, or when it encourages a breach of contract, or when we look at history and realize that ultimately our trust must be in each other and not in big organizations, and that sometimes we have to give the individual the benefit of the doubt. Again, I feel the need this morning to avoid the obvious cases that talk about the clash of religious people and modern law. The growing troubles of the two in our modern Europe have been illuminated far better than I could anyway by Lady Hale, in her 2014 lecture on human rights for the Law Society of Ireland, which is easy to find online and which touches on what we're talking about today. One thing that does trouble me, however, is the way in which conscience is more or less forced into a religious complaint when complaints arise under the Human Rights Convention or the Human Rights Acts. There are more countries in the Council of Europe which monitors human rights than there are in the European Union. And the Convention on Human Rights seeks to protect conscience in Article 9, prevent discrimination in Article 14, but qualifies religious ob objections and conscientious objections as different things which might be subject to state restriction. This has caused all sorts of debate and uh, has caused difficulties. For instance, if I went to the newspapers and refused to carry out or facilitate an activity to which I objected. And I argued the right of freedom of expression under Article 9 straight out. I'd be told, well, that's a qualified right. Governments can restrict it because there might be issues of public decency or morality or security. So then I fall back on 9.2, which says, OK, I have a, an objection which is based on freedom of religion. And that objection is much stronger. But then a government might fall back on Article 14, which says that religion is qualified, although less so, because discrimination is generally wrong. So then I have to find a way to communicate to people that I want to discriminate against others and cast it in terms of some sort of um, spiritual necessity. And that forces people into saying, it's my religion that means that I have to behave like this, or it's my moral being expressed in religion, rather than simply saying, I have an objection of conscience, and conscience can be expressed in secular terms and in terms of reason. Cases get forced into religious boxes 
and then the press do the rest. This is enormously divisive. Well, recently some EU judges have offered a way out of this box, but they've invoked a concept that is more known than describable. That case that I'm talking about is Iweda and others versus the UK, which emerged into the European Court in 2013. And it came to my attention via Lady Hale's talk. I came across the paragraph in the dissent, which I think is important for this audience, where judges did, did Gaetano and Vucinic, and I apologize for my pronunciation, said what they believed conscience should be. Conscience is what enjoins a person at the moment to do good and avoid evil. It is a judgment of reason whereby a physical person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act that they are going to perform, are in the process of performing, or has already completed. This rational judgment on what is good and what is evil, though it may be nurtured by religious belief, is not necessarily religious, and people with no beliefs or affiliations make such judgments constantly. They should be protected. The judges went on to draw from the very great literature that exists on what soldiers should refuse to do in war, on what government employees can refuse to do in peacetime and in war. They explicitly differentiated between religion and conscience, but it was a dissenting judgment. And so it still remains what lawyers call moot. It's still not properly explained. But there is a kernel in European law of the idea that you can argue on conscience without mentioning the spirit or without mentioning religion at all. Now, the ECHR is not, of course, an EU institution, though the effects of the European Court's accession to the Convention are still being worked out. But if people become persuaded by that judgment, then we do live in a European Union, where we live in it, where those who have secular objections must be protected by states where whistleblowing is known about and defended, and where the European institutions may be under a duty to protect conscience. Building that in would be the single most important way of making governments and corporations aware that they cannot put pressure on people who talk about genuine conscientious objection. Conscience, therefore, balances the public commons against the requirements of private contract, either with the state or a private body. It manifests itself too, and this is something you as an audience might want to think about, in the behavior of physicians and healthcare providers. Biggest employer in Europe is the National Health Service in Britain. Spain's biggest employer is the Spanish Health Service. Those health services require people to make decisions every day, which increasingly meet with objections of secular conscience. It manifests itself in the behavior of public notaries and registrars, employees, the self-employed, and volunteers. If conscience is a good thing and builds social capital and makes democracy possible, it has to be protected within these organizations as much as others. It's in the nature of conscience, however, to be intensely irritating. Dr. Beck is going to talk to you about the toleration of dissent. I don't want to invade his territory at all, except to say that Dissent, later on today, I hope, will be linked to this idea of conscience because modern political parties, the modern media, and in a sense even modern academia do tend to require party lines and do tend not to like dissent and do tend to find ways to call conscience simply being irritating. But if conscience is the grit in the machine, which runs up against any ideology, and if we do want to avoid the politics of self-accumulation and competition, then we do have to link it to dissent, and we do have to tolerate difference. Finally, I think conscience is about something that the social media, oddly enough, which I've talked about, work against, and that's courtesy. I mentioned before the need to understand what another person is saying. If we have no respect for each other, we can have no respect for what we do together. Twitter, Facebook, blogging, all of these things almost encourage people to turn up under assumed names and 
abuse people right, left, and center, often in very funny ways. They don't, however, contribute to a healthy trust in other people. I remember going off to Minnesota once to give a lecture in the United States. Fairly innocuous talk. Couldn't got more boring, I think. I think it was about public debt and morality before debt started accumulating in America. And within 10 minutes of stepping down, the phones were buzzing and uh, I was being called a moon bat by people who hadn't been at the lecture but decided that I must be one. I can take that and I can give it back, but those, if, we have, if that's the basis of our discussion, if that's the basis of our social networking, then we're living in a very strange society. If, on the other hand, we understand that other people believe as we do, just have come to different outcomes, we stumble towards Hannah Arendt and John Locke and those who argue that reason and consent and discussion are possible. And things that unite Joseph Ratzinger and John Locke, by the way, probably are onto something, because they're not natural bedfellows in any sense. Conscience encourages engagement without personal confrontation, lifts us away from all that fun tweeting. In that sense, I think Shakespeare said, conscience makes cowards of us all, because it stops us from plunging into fights with each other. But it also calls us to be citizens and persons of courage. It requires us to do what is right, which was the story before 1989 in Central and Eastern Europe, and now is increasingly the story in Western Europe. It provides a foundation for the sort of courage that comes from reflection, self-examination, and introspection. It is appropriately despised by the powerful in the run of things as an impediment to solutions and as an argument against automatic actions and crushing threats. Yet, the most personal of things, conscience, allows us to integrate ourselves with others in dignity and security and peace. And that's what the European Charter of Fundamental Rights keeps saying it's all about, though it doesn't mention the phrase conscience once, I think. That's the sort of thing that Europe should aspire to. And it ought to be one of the fundamental goals of what the judges in the case of Van Gend and Luce, uh, the foundational European law case, called our new legal order. Now, I appreciate that lots of this has been somewhat dry today. Uh, but I hope it set the tone for our discussion of what it takes to have a proper democratic citizenship in Europe. And I hope you forgive me for some of the jokes or more glib observations I put in. You know, when they, uh, having done a, a, a few of these sorts of talks, you realize there are three things that should be in a, uh, an argument based on philosophy. There should be some observation that links Socrates and Nietzsche, that to, to be is to do. You know what's coming. That something that links Sartre and Kant, to do is to be. And something that brings up a bit of Frank Sinatra, doobie doobie doo. I hope that it's been thought-provoking, and I hope that it starts a discussion other than uh, on your Twitter pages. And uh, I think, looking at the time, that we're coming up to a moment when questions would be appropriate. The um, sheet that I had uh, about timings here said that I was meant to go on until 11, but I'm sure that we can uh, move into questions now. And I wonder if anybody has any. So the, the question, if you allow me to rephrase it, uh, is what's the, my view of conscience with regard to democracy and to the functioning of government? And you mentioned Edward Snowden and uh, security cases like that. Um, I'm afraid I'd take a, a somewhat extreme view. I, I'm, you get to an age where people tell you that something is so secret it should never be let out or that people will be endangered or that it's commercially confidential. And when you're privy to these sorts of secrets or when you realize what they are or when they do come out, you realize that 90% of the time they were covering political embarrassment and they were, or they were covering controversial questions that should have been debated. So my approach would be that a whistleblower adds to freedom of information and that if we have a public sphere, there should be as few places as possible where secrecy is involved. 
Now I think as well technology is on my side in this, in that the nature of electronic media now is that you can find out just about anything you want uh, on the electronic media. And in fact, government these days has become in part a way of shaping what people sh look at rather than what they know. Uh, I'm reminded somewhat glibly of the story of the echelon system of surveillance in the 1990s. Uh, the American government was not allowed to listen in to portable phones when they first emerged. Uh, in the United States, we know now they have been, but they were in Europe. The way that we know this is that the uh, American command in NATO went to the European Parliament and admitted it and nobody paid any attention. Uh, had Edward Snowden revealed that, he would have gone to jail. I think it was better that it was admitted. I think it was a shame that the attention wasn't paid. So I think the functioning of democracy requires as much openness and as little secrecy as possible. I do think there are areas where secrecy is temporarily necessary, but I'd be in favor of, favor of a 10-year disclosure of things and let the chips fall where they may. I know that's not what um, many people believe. And many of the, um, we're talking about Europe too. <laughs> you know, I come from an Oxford background where um, there's a, a poster you can pick up in the shops with someone boring someone to death saying, and ninthly. But I've just thought of another point, so I'm going to say it. Um, it's the case that many of these issues are to do with um, what's vaguely termed national security. And when you look at them, um, a lot of the issues that people wanted swept under the carpet or kept confidential weren't about national security. They were about people doing things they shouldn't have been doing which were counterproductive and which the public wouldn't have put up with. And so I think the highest degree of openness is, a, is necessary for democracy, and I think democracies ought to protect people who are open. People who, outside of power always say that, and then they get in, and then they discover reasons why things should be confidential. Uh, when it comes to commercial confidentiality, I think that that's a very fine, there's a very fine line between monopoly and corruption and genuine commercial secrecy, and I'd be in favor of not having any secrets after five or six years. Um, I think that's the way the technology is going too. People can find tax returns online, they can find details. What we really have to do is protect the whistleblower, but also educate people into finding out where the information is. And maybe that's something that I haven't touched on, which I should have. Conscience these days is in large part about telling people what they already know but don't want to hear. And that perhaps is uh, something that we might discuss. I hope that answers your question. Sorry for the length of it. No, no, no. If again I can say for the camera, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think, I think what you, you asked is that we have a, this communicative space, we have this idea of information, but there's so much of it that we can't distinguish between what's right and what's wrong or what's going on. And, we don't, and lots of people don't want to or don't know how to work out. Yes, that information makes us intolerant. Uh, it might well be that that is the case. There are examples every day of that sort of thing. I saw one as I was coming in. Um, I talked today about a need for common values because I think conscience is uh, located in the idea and the European judges I quoted talk about it being located in the idea that something, some things are wrong and other things are not wrong. And conscience is about saying what is wrong. But when I came in today, I looked at the newspaper just on the stand in uh, East Finchley Station. It was, the, it was talking about a Daily Mail piece. Um, the Daily Mail sometimes exists to pose questions of conscience in the sense of uh, how on earth do they think they can get away with putting this on, um, about how holiday makers on the island of Kos were having their holidays spoiled by all these migrants who were fleeing war. Uh, from North Africa and the Middle East and how it meant that they were never going to go back there again because they couldn't sit down at their restaurants and have a nice meal because of all these starving people on the beach. And I remember thinking that there are going to be people reading that thinking quite right and there are also going to be, I hope, more people reading that thinking, what about those starving people on the beach? 
the information is there, the discrimination of the information is an issue. If conscience became something that was just each of us feeling a bit unsettled, I think it would break down as a legal idea. But if we had things that we knew somehow were not right in common, or even if there were things, if there was an idea that we could judge something to be not right and somebody else might judge something else to be not right, and if it didn't hurt anyone, we should respect that decision, I think that's where conscience would come into play. So if, for instance, I have things that I don't believe are right, and you have things that you don't believe are right, and they're different, the idea of conscience protects our discussion, protects our debate, and it should protect either of us legally if we are told by our employer to do any of the things we don't think are right. But if we just have the rule that what's right is what everybody thinks, that there's nothing um, that is correct and that efficiency and the greatest good of the greatest number is what's important, then conscience just becomes an inefficient blockage on the system. So we have to have some common understanding. We have to think in the same way. We don't have to agree. I hope that doesn't complicate things too much. But um, I do think there is a danger of everybody knowing everything and then everybody not bothering about it at all. Uh, and of course, it's a government strategy these days to just release all the information um, <laughs> with a couple of um, bits of information that aren't true uh, as well thrown in, and then to say, well, anybody that wants to talk about it is just boring and we should move on. Um, that's what's happening in part with these migrations in the Pacific and in uh, the Mediterranean. Um, but I do think conscience is essential to a, a working democracy that's more than just voting. And I think that the you, you quite rightly raise the issue of a sea of information, uh, but that's why we have education, and that would be why we would protect people when we said to them, if you genuinely believe something is right, you should stand up for it. And that would be what the protection of conscience was. Um, got a whole audience now who's going to stand up and say, we genuinely believe you're wrong, and walk out. <laughs> uh, there's a question over here. Sorry. Thank you. Your question for the camera was, could I clarify whether I thought the reciprocity was about the, the mutual trust that comes from people uh, expressing themselves to each other, communicating with each other, and was this necessary for democracy and was it a duty? I think it was. So the idea of reciprocity is that uh, I can see you, I can see if you disagree or agree, you respectfully agree or disagree, and I do the same and it creates a degree of trust. If we put anything between us, a label, a mask, a way of dividing ourselves that filters that trust, then we weaken democracy. Now the idea of reciprocity, interestingly, only really comes up in French debates about the burqa. I didn't propose to take any position on that today uh, about the Islamic clothing, hijabs, niqabs, burqas, and so forth. And the reason I think that people reached for it was that there was a much more powerful idea of laicite, of secularization, but this necessarily caused huge tension and didn't talk about any sort of duty on the part of those who disagreed. Whereas reciprocity is the idea of courtesy and of equal rights being respected and equal expressions being necessary. You can't communicate if there's no space for communication. It comes up in French debates, it's coming up in European debates, and I think it should be linked to conscience, because I think it means that I need to understand that your conscience is just as valid as mine, and that I need to interpret what you're saying with a full amount of information, just as you need to interpret mine. It makes communication in a democracy a personal thing, but it also because it's personal, forces us into reason and into courtesy towards each other. I think that um, this is why rights are qualified a lot of the time. Um, there are, you're talking about, uh, for instance, the Northern Ireland case, where uh, groups were asked to provide a cake with a message on it which they did not wish to provide, but which was not one that was against the law. 
Now, I think that there are, uh, that, that, that the judgment that, was, that came to there was that if you are operating in a commercial setting, you cannot directly discriminate against any one group, and that this overruled uh, your right of expression. There was no uh, attempt to argue a conscience clause in general in that case. If one had argued that your conscience genuinely led you to not want to provide a good on that basis, I think you would have to bring evidence as to why. I think you would have to show that there was a reasoned objection. And I think that that case uh, in the commercial sphere uh, might well have failed. Um, but I think the argument and the persuasion would have been good for all sides. I think just not having a confrontation, just not imposing rights on people is a good idea. Incidentally, uh, in the case of the it's, it's irrelevant, but I'll bring it up anyway because I'm a member of the bar. Um, uh, in the case of the so-called gay cake scandal in Northern Ireland, uh, people were asking a bakery to bake a cake to celebrate a civil union and call it a marriage, uh, when, of course, it's not possible to have uh, a marriage ceremony, a same-sex marriage ceremony in Northern Ireland. So you ended up with a very Northern Irish contradiction that people were being prosecuted for not baking a cake for a ceremony which couldn't happen uh, in a legal area which was disputed. Um, and then the British media got involved as well. It's a long-winded way of saying I think persuasion and debate and discussion is important. I think this is, um, it's important not to go down the American route of saying this is my position and you will respect it, but rather saying this is my position, I know that you have one too, Let's have a structure where we can persuade and discuss. I think in the, I think in the circumstances of things, the company would still have had to bake the cake. If it was commercial, just like a hotel would still have to accommodate people um, who were adults who were paying. It couldn't indirectly discriminate. But I think a quieter discussion based on a respect for conscience would be better than the idea that there's just a right you slam down. Because, of course, these things shade into each other. Um, you have discrimination and dispute escalating if you don't have persuasion and respect. And conscience, the idea of conscience and the protection for conscience creates respect, I think. Can I throw in something here? Because I think we're sacrificed. Yes, and again, I hope you don't mind me truncating things for the camera. Um, how to reduce that into a tweet for the camera. But reciprocity means homogeneity because um, people need to have people who are like them. But my principle would be different. My uh, argument would be um, that common values like conscience and common humanity would suggest that what we require is something that helps us communicate, which is courtesy and a legal process that protects our conscience. Now, um, I agree with you about the welfareism in Europe, but I would point out that it's only in Britain and Spain where the government provides welfare to everybody without insurance. Uh, we have a thing called national insurance here, but it isn't really, it's taxed. And that requires everybody to think it's a, a common government acting for everybody. And if the government seems to be acting for people uh, who are somehow different, there's scope for disagreement. Um, in most of the rest of Europe, insurance means that the, the welfare systems are delivered to people who have paid in or who are going to pay in. Um, but I, I wouldn't have located the argument and didn't locate the argument in um, that sphere at all. I would have said that um, it would be possible to uh, talk about people as people, as immigrants, migrants, citizens, city dwellers, rural dwellers, and that an idea of conscience would protect the understanding that everybody thought that they were doing something right and that they had to be respected. Now, it might be that we come to a disagreement at the end, but that's better than a culture of rights, per se, where everybody just says, this is what I want, this is what I do, this is what I get. Uh, we need to focus on persuasion and discussion, and that requires protection of those who are distinguished more than just freedom of expression, because freedom of expression encourages anybody to say whatever they like. 
Um, and if you say whatever you like, you end up offending people. If you say what you mean uh, without, well, honest, well, if you say what you mean honestly and clearly without, um, but with concern for the other person, without wanting to offend them, I think that's a bit better. Um, on a more general point, um, the idea, of course, conscience would build up social capital that has been destroyed by us being uh, demonstrably different societies across Europe. Um, and uh, people believe across Britain, but that's never been true uh, in London, um, or indeed in Britain. I mean, um, to turn this into a parochial debate, I am a person of Irish heritage standing in a British island under an English and Welsh government uh, with the London Assembly looking to the European Union um, and the European Commission and the European Council uh, for uh, a discussion which has emerged in the United States, really, a lot of the time. And so we need to rebuild those structures of social capital. We re need to rebuild those structures of discussion, particularly if we don't want them to be religious ones. Now, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I am a religious person in the sense I'm a Catholic, but I don't want common values to be necessarily um, from my faith. I want values to be those that can bring us all together. And then I want to persuade or discuss. Uh, I, I think that that's important globally, and I think that that is what's going to save us from a, a world of fighting and stabbing and, and haranguing each other that the social media encourage. So th the question is, what's the practical purpose of everyone having more discussions? Which is great for lawyers and academics. We can discuss everything all the time. But I think, you know, look, there has to be a cutoff, and you have to... Ultimately, we live in a real world where politics and decisions have to be made and where politics happen and where some people lose out. But my point would be if we have as big a conversation as possible, as open and as free a conversation as possible and as respectful a conversation to start with, and then if we genuinely respect those who disagree at the end, their disagreement will be the safety valve just in case we make a mistake because democracies make mistakes. And conscience is the ultimate safeguard because it requires individuals to agree. So we would consciously have to tell people, you can disagree with this, but we would have to, decide, we would have to define how. Because otherwise everyone would disagree with everything they dislike. So I think it's the last protection, the last redoubt uh, for that. But I don't see anything wrong with having a bigger discussion through media, through uh, politics to start with. I suspect your question was linked. And then I'll... Yes. More local politics, more direct politics. The question was, would I be in favor of more direct ward democracy or local democracy? Yes. I think the bigger things get, the more secretive and dangerous they get. And I think smaller is sometimes better. Although that's, that's perhaps the European model of subsidiarity, which we've never really talked about because no one has really ever wanted to define it because it might reduce some of the um, high authorities. So... Not if, if the question is, does religion interfere with democracy and bringing people together? I think. Am I right in. Does, do, do religions and certain religions interfere? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. But my emphasis would be on persuasion. I'm not a complete secularist. I think that it's perfectly okay for people to try and persuade others of their values. But I think that there are values which all can hold and which for instance, would be that the, a person should not be disintegrated, that people should not be driven mad by the suppression of uh, their conscience, that uh, the state should not pursue people without rules of law which appear in all societies. So I would fall back on what proponents of conscience always fall back upon, which is the idea that there are rules of law, that there are rules of persuasion, and that this does not... Uh, obviate or remove or require religion to go away or to do anything. What it requires is for a basic rule, which is not offensive to anybody, that people be respected. Uh, I think that, that conscience be respected and that we give people a way of protecting that in court. Um, that goes along with the earlier question that more information is better. The more we know, the better and more we understand. And so I, again, 
we fall back on the idea that if people are going around saying, you must believe this, you must do this, you must not talk to this person or that person, well, that's not compatible with democracy. And democracy is compatible with the protection of belief, and so they're destroying their beliefs. They're destroying our beliefs, they're destroying our social capital if they say that. Yes. I think your question is, does it hold for groups when everybody is different? Um, uh, and links to Dr. Hecate's uh, very well taken point about homogeneity. I, 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 <laughs> uh, I, I suppose I'm forced to fall back on the idea that we have our cultural differences, but that we are all human. Uh, as far as I know, uh, my, you know, my family is Irish, my wife is South Korean, I grew up with Scottish people and we can communicate and I think that um, the, the Venn diagrams of potential violence and misunderstanding in that, uh, uh, in that background as such, that if I can navigate them, others can navigate them. But to be less glib, there's the, the idea of democracy, uh, of course, is in transition. It's a, above what I wanted to talk about today, but there's a difference between what you might call the 19th or the 20th century versions of nation states with demos that were ethnic or that were people in many countries and an idea now about respectful communication and equal citizenship and equal rights. Uh, I would tend to stand with those who believe that we as humans can maintain our cultures and our languages but respect each other and I think that that was what I was talking about. Uh, I understand that that's not what many people genuinely think uh, the state should do, but I think there's a, I think I can point to states that work like that, and many states that fail because they don't work like that. Um, so you had a question. What is the role of truth? <laughs> there's always one question that <laughs> goes right to the heart of things that you should have called for coffee beforehand. You know? I don't pretend to know what truth is, but I can tell you that um, I respect the idea that you might think that you know what the truth is and that I know what the truth is and that we can discuss uh, truth. Very often, uh, what I've been trying to do today is to suggest that it, as a, p a practical, political and legal point, conscience works because it allows for us to have those debates and discussions. If we were in fact discussing something very different, which is that there is a truth. Um, I think that uh, I think that that, which of course is the business of philosophy, would would move us away from the business of politics and law, and of public life. Uh, well, if you have, yeah, that's quite right. But that's an individual. The indi your question there was, or your point there, is that politics is about controlling the truth of information. Well. Uh, to link to an earlier point, uh, the more information that we have and the better, ed the, the more that we can distinguish between information by our education systems, by our values, by our respect for each other, the more we can work together and the more we can work through what actually happened. It would be very difficult to maintain a rule of conscience in which everybody believed in a lie, I think. So... I'm not quite sure what the theological term for that is. Apodiesis, is it? it's where you find out what truth is by knowing what it's not. Well, you know, as they did in the Middle Ages. I think it's quite possible for conscience to be very useful in telling us what truth isn't and for reminding politicians that what they say is not necessarily true and for reminding judges that what they think is not necessarily the law. Um, I'm not sure that it's very much use for finding the ultimate truth of things, which I think is a, a different matter completely. I hope that answers your, your point. I think many are. I tried not to ground conscience. Uh, your question was, to, to what extent do people get manipulated by their moral beliefs? I think morality influences what some people talk about conscience as. Um, but my point was that um, you need to, if you're talking about a practical view of conscience in law and politics, it has to be about protecting something people have done that exposes something somebody else has done or not done. It can't be about what's moral or right for everybody. 
Because if it is what, about what's moral or right for everybody, everyone will disagree on what's moral or right. So I would suggest that legally and politically it's better, of course that's a moral term, to uh, respect other people, to understand that some people will think that things are wrong, and to understand this is a very useful check on tyranny and authoritarianism and on bad behavior, and have a legal process that protects it. As to whether everybody is always going to be able to prove that they had a real conscientious objection, I think that's why you would have a legal process. I think, you could, I think it's possible to put people on stands or put people... Uh, or ask people, do you really, really object to this, or is this just a convenient objection? Because conscience is a compulsion. It is something you must do. And I, I think that, that that would be what would distinguish a lot of the cases. As for morality, per se, I deliberately avoided it today, because I think everybody um, uh, respectfully can disagree on morality. I wanted to talk about the protection of conscience in public life as a legal issue. Um, I suspect we agree about um, some people becoming fanatic about that sort of thing. But this is why conscience rather than rights is good. Because if you look at the United States where things have been absolutely poisoned by people believing that they're morally right and morally better and the other side is morally wrong, it's become very difficult for anybody to do anything. Um, I was presenting absolute truth, which I understood as a philosophical point, as too complicated for civic discussion. And I have tried to present functional uses of conscience today. I think there are emergent values from the concept of conscience, which is that there should be legal procedures that protect it and there should be a role for conscience that we understand. In normal discussion, of course, conscience does link to what's right. And in normal discussion, what's right links to truth. But I fall back on the idea that I was talking about something workable in law and politics and not normality. Uh, because if we all behaved as we do in law and politics, I think life would be an awful lot more tense <laughs> and um, there'd be many more arguments. Um, so I'm not dismissing your point at all, but I think you're quite right. I was talking about emergent values from conscience, one of which is that there should be a commitment to at least the idea that somebody doesn't buy what you're saying and that they should be respected in that. Uh, I wasn't talking about absolute truth, as uh, the gentleman over there uh, identified, because I don't think that uh, I don't think that I can. Yeah. Uh, you, your question is, what did I mean by reciprocity? What I meant was that we had both a duty and a right to expect that we could have a space between us where we could communicate that uh, it would be wrong to hide our beliefs and expressions from each other, and that we should communicate honestly and with a, a spirit of courtesy. Um, when it comes to dissent, and the actual issue of political dissent or religious dissent, and the limits thereon, obviously as a group uh, thing, I think that that doesn't actually, that, goes to, that runs parallel to what I'm talking about, because we can respect other groups. We can respect their ideas, or that they have their ideas, even if we don't respect their ideas. Um, the problem is that a lot of this runs into just a general freedom of expression. And I was talking about a practical protection for the individual who said that is not right. So an individual within a community that had very strong views who didn't believe in that should not be subject to the disintegration of their being and, and coercion. They should be subject to persuasion, just as between communities there should be persuasion. That should be an absolute value, I think. Uh, and an absolute wrong would be coercing someone into believing something or saying something they don't believe. Now, um, beyond that, I think we're getting into expression and dissent. Um, and I have to say, I... Uh, I hadn't prepared for it today, and I'm just, uh, it's an interesting question, but I'm somewhat thrown by it, so I'll just fall back on saying I was talking about conscience. I'm sorry for the cop-out. <laughs> you know, William Jennings Bryan used to say, uh, when he was talking in the... Not everybody I was just about to explain. <laughs> William, William Jennings Bryan was a 19th century American orator, the boy orator of the Platte. And he would spend many mornings going around giving speeches and lectures and talking and... Uh, discussing things 
uh, with Americans, you know, all sorts of communities. He did the Cross of Gold speech. He did the speech. Uh, he also uh, apocryphally came up with what Oscar Wilde later said was his observation when in a gunslinging town that uh, Shakespeare was dead and then someone said who shot him. But the main thing I thought of there was that Jennings Bryan said that you should always do three things when you're talking. You should make sure there's a space between you and the audience. You should make sure the audience are friendly and you should know where the door is. Um, uh, because there will always be a question that is better than you. And I think that uh, I've had several of those today. My point though would be, look, if you have, wasn't buying time, if you have different communities with, if you have different communities with different beliefs, that's fine. They need to persuade, they need to respect each other. And they, if we're in a democracy, we cannot simply live separate lives and expect that, and to call that a democracy. That's not a democracy. Um, any more than living in two separate hotel rooms on either end of town is a marriage. You know, it, 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 there's a, a sodality or a community to democracy. And conscience is just a way of building that in. The European Union's casting around for ways to protect and connect uh, with individuals in a complex modern world in which nation states are shifting uh, and religious communities and others are offering uh, sodality, offering uh, connections, but I think that there's still some mileage in the idea that we can talk to each other in reciprocity, which means we have to give reciprocal rights and reciprocal respect to each other. If we don't, then uh, we might as well stop pretending that we care about uh, what anybody else thinks. That's what I meant by reciprocity. Your question is, are there, uh, are there blurred lines between freedom of expression and uh, discrimination, um, and do we, is it, uh, does it undermine the argument that I suppose is implicit, does it under undermine conscience to have the idea that we shouldn't discriminate? Well, of course, your question has gone to the heart of the European law debate and the human rights debate on whether some forms of discrimination are justifiable or not, and which forms are. There is a whole complex debate uh, in Europe on four things. One is the idea of direct discrimination, which generally is wrong, but in some circumstances is not. Uh, toilets are different for different people. Uh, you might have uh, discrimination by ability and so forth. Indirect discrimination, where you have a neutral category that discriminates against one group in particular, uh, where you have a margin of appreciation where some courts can say, okay, we'll qualify this right and balance it against that right. And uh, the idea of a qualified right itself. All of these are intense discussions. What they tend to boil down to is the facts. And the combination of a trust in judges who are open about their judgment and who have to explain it. Uh, a discussion of facts which might be different in different cases and come to a different conclusion. And my point would be, regardless of that, there should be a legal process to see if something is discrimination or not, and that maybe we can have rules that are generally true, but that blur at the edges because people blur at the edges. I don't think you can have hard and fast rules. And I think, in fact, if you did have hard and fast rules, conscience would be the protection, because people would come forward and say, well, not in this case. Um, then we come down to what um, uh, this gentleman here, I think, would probably know about, uh, the, the jurisprudence uh, of all of this. There's a whole legal debate uh, about what values we should follow, what processes we should follow, and what we should not. You can balance Carl Schmitt against HLA Hart and so forth. And Schmitt says that rules emerge which are functional, and Hart says, well, you can trust judges, um, which has not necessarily been uh, completely true, but if you make them say why they're coming to the decision they are, you give them the possibility of dissenting, and you create appeals, you create a legal process, then at least we can know where we are, and then legislators and the public can say if they wholly disagree. Because there will always be things that are, d are different, and to differentiate is at some level to discriminate. So you'd want to have some degree of agreement on what you're going to do, and a protection for those who feel they've been hurt by it. There was, uh, if, if I 
just repeat those for the camera. The first one is reciprocity. How, what's the role of education? The second is what's the role of the free flow of labor in this uh, issue? First one with reciprocity, I, think educa I don't think common education is necessarily any better than uh, different types of education so long as the outcome is people who respect each other and who are aware of uh, both their traditions and the traditions of others. I'm in favor of ecosystems and not monoliths. So if you have lots of different sorts of school, so long as they are all um, able to uh, produce people who can respect each other, might not agree with each other, but who can respect with each other, I have no problem with different sorts of school. I think education is best when it is uh, clear and honest and challenges uh, the community from which people come. But uh, I'm not one of those in Britain who think that all education should be the same, all comprehensive, or all produced in one way, because then you have standardized tests and a standardized view of what's right and wrong, and you have the crushing of different cultures. Um, when it comes to the free movement of labor, I guess all the questions today, but um, I would characterize that as uh, an argument implicit in the idea of nation states. I think that there's a fundamental problem if you have international capital, international labor, but um, borders. Uh, I think this is a problem that's as old as Kant, who talked about the way that we are born in one patch of the world, which we somehow think is ours, and that another patch of the world is not, but that we must understand that all of it is ours. Um, I'm not particularly sure I have any answer whatsoever. I'm not a great nationalist, and you know, um, I have two passports. Uh, I could have a third passport, but for the fact that the Republic of South Korea, for some reason, doesn't seem to think I am a Korean. Uh, the <laughs> um, I have lived with people from many, many different places. And I know this is somewhat narcissistic, but I, um, I find it very difficult to, uh, and I do teach economics sometimes, but I find it um, difficult to engage with borders as an economic question. As a political question, if you have borders, you will have tension when people come across those borders. My point would be uh, if I would fall back on a rule of, uh, of uh, proportionality and legitimacy. If a state is bringing people in, they should be treated equally. They should be, we should uh, convey respect to them and they should uh, convey respect to us. But I wouldn't go beyond that point because I don't know what I would be talking about. I think. So the last question has elicited from a member of the bar the admission that he doesn't know what he's talking about, which I think uh, deserves the, the laurel today. Um, uh, thank you very much for all of that. We're going to go and have some coffee. I'm going to hang around, and then we've got some presentations, I think, which I'm, if you'll let me, I'll stay for. Thank you. So I'm really glad to be here and uh, to be given the opportunity to speak. So. I represent here uh, Estonia, but I'm from Georgia. And uh, having regarded the content of my speech, I should announce in the beginning that uh, I'm Georgian and I'm European. And uh, last November, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the collapse of Berlin Wall um, and uh, fall of uh, Berlin Wall. And uh, during that time, the Cold War ended, the Iron Curtain crumbled, and uh, Europe experienced a continent-wide uh, euphoria. Uh, however, not everyone was happy with this result, because for Putin, it was a trauma. Because he, he did not love uh, communists so much, but this collapse of Berlin Wall marked an end of uh, Russia's great power at the center of Soviet empire. And Russia lost control over the half of uh, Europe. According to the idealistic belief, the gain for Europe would not be the loss for, er for Russia. And uh, the divide, like, I er an era of dividing lines in Europe ended, finished. However, today we see the cost from the 20th century back in our reality. And uh, Maidan protests and the revolution last year is perceived as a belated episode of Velvet Revolutions, which took place in uh, Eastern Europe uh, during the 90s. And Putin's punishment, uh, and punishment of Ukraine by Putin, uh, was kind of revenge for the world he lost back in 1989. And uh, it clearly indicates that uh, the 
struggle for freedom in Europe is not history and it is not over. Today, my nation, along with the rest of Eastern Partnership countries, is united by the desire to go and goal to live in a country free from external control and uh, disregarding of being threatened uh, by its location in a sphere of big brother's influence. But however, this free choice of my country is becoming less free. Today, Georgia and Ukraine and also Moldova uh, are like Germany a generation ago are the countries with a deep wound running through the middle of these countries. And uh, this wall once again divides Europe because we are part of Europe and it uh, creates a lines for fear. And Russia's uh, kind of denial to comprehend the, uh, the uh, kind of uh, independent and uh, uh, sovereign uh, decision of these countries to rejoin the European family clearly indicates that uh, it still neglects the free choice of these countries. Uh, but, uh, and this World War, uh, so, I'm sorry, uh, um, Berlin Wall still exists, but it has shifted to the east several kilometers. Uh, my generation and my friends and colleagues living in Eastern Europe, they often claim that young people and also experts and pundits in the Western Europe really underestimate the threats coming from Russia, even for the entire Europe. And it really inspired me to describe better how dangerous Putin can be for the whole Europe, not only for the Eastern Europe. And uh, I uh, tried to uh, kind of outline uh, what was the like, uh, following events after the um, collapse of Berlin Wall. And uh, as uh, Robert Cooper uh, says, um, the collapse of Berlin Wall came to an end, not only uh, a Cold War or Second World War, but it also created the new post-Cold War European order. And this European order is now challenged and uh, is being challenged. We couldn't <coughs> believe it would be after the collapse of second, uh, after a collapse of Berlin Wall. But what was uh, kind of really uh, innovation of in this Cold War, in the post-Cold War European order was that uh, um, it uh, uh, marked an end of uh, political system of three centuries, the balance of power and imperial appetites of uh, European countries. Also, the postmodern system rejects the use of force as an instrument to uh, solve the conflicts. And uh, Brussels-based institutions of modern Europe were built in order to prevent authoritarianism and ethnic nationalism from ever t uh, t uh, again taking root in the continents uh, and leading it to a war. But what we face now from the Russian side is absolutely antagonistic approach toward these values and principles of the post-Cold War European order. Mr. Putin's uh, attack on uh, these values and principles are manifold. First, uh, Russia still thinks as a 19th century uh, great power, which still perceives the world through a balance of power and spheres of influence. Second, as he declared as a justification of his uh, intervention in eastern Ukraine, he, it try, he tried to defend its own compatriots, which is clearly kind of nationalistic clay. And um, if we look at the history, Hitler had the same uh, justification of its incursion into the uh, Austria back in 1938. Uh, uh, and uh, the third uh, point is that um, Russia's behavior is also kind of imperialistic because they have an ambition to control any territories where Russian language is spoken. And it clearly causes kind of secessionist movements and it undermines the territorial integrity of countries where Russian my, um, ethnic minorities are living. And um, that's why it's quite similar to imperialism. And also, Vladimir Putin's current regime represents a like, mix of political authoritarianism and combining with religious conservatism, which is an alternative model of European values. But at the head, in the center of this um, conflict is not uh, democracy versus authoritarianism. This is 
postmodern kind of um, entity versus modern state. And uh, in my paper, I will describe and extend this claim further, but unfortunately, I don't have time to uh, go in deep in depth in, uh, in, at this point. And uh, while the European Union follows a postmodern logic, uh, Russia elites, uh, elites uh, favor to Westphalian understanding of sovereignty. And as I mentioned, it still perceives the world through a uh, balance of power prism. And uh, the, in the Kremlin's vocabulary, sovereign power is a synonym for great power. Russia in the uh, 90s was not a postmodern country, but it was a, a member of post-Cold War European order. But however, surprisingly, this country decided to build its statehood on uh, the principles and ideologies of 19th century Europe rather than 21st century of Europe. And uh, as Igor Krastev, a public thinker from uh, Bulgaria, says, uh, for Moscow, the EU postmodernism is what vegetarianism is for cannibals and irritating irrelevance. But you may ask how this everything is related to the descent and conscious. Um, first of all, I would like to underline that Ukrainian case and also um, the developments during the period of decade, namely these color revolutions, appear the really nightmare for Putin. Because Putin is afraid of uh, descent in its society rather than Western air jets, tanks, or even sanctions. Because this is a very central and vertical state system, and any kind of uh, dissent in this country can collapse the whole Putin's regime. That's why he tries to prevent this in, at, um, at any cost. And uh, even attack on Ukraine was, to, was an attempt to prevent uh, uh, spilling over of Maidan uh, sentiments into the Russian society and in country. It tried to prevent Maidan happening in Russia. And uh, also, if Ukrainian people managed to translate these Maidan uh, kind of uh, opinions and uh, public it into the real life and into the politics and into the related relations of the, of the West, it really becomes a real danger for Putin. And European Union with its emphasis on human rights and openness, threatens the Kremlin's sovereign democracy project. This is also a very specific concept, which is sovereign democracy, and it, it was invented by kind of uh, ideological uh, fathers of uh, Russia's current regime, and uh, I, it will be widely uh, discussed in my uh, paper also. And uh, the, the, the European Union's this promotion democracy policy really awakes the nightmare for Putin uh, and uh, because um, uh, it really feels threatened uh, by the invasion of uh, Western-funded NGOs, and uh, Kremlin is tempted to recreate this um, state uh, policy, state policy state, in order to prevent foreign in interference in its domestic politics. And referring Krastev again, uh, color revolutions in Ukraine and Georgia during the previous decade was Putin's 9/11. Um, and finally, the European Union views the lack of democracy as a major source of instability in Eurasia. And Russia views weak democracies and the Western policy of exporting democracy as a major source of instability in the post-Soviet space. So basically, it was a brief outline of my paper where I tried to introduce the discrepancies and uh, controversies between these two powers. And uh, the questions are more than welcome, and I will try to reply in, in, in more details after you, I will get some feedback from you. Thank you. The, my presentation is uh, on conscience censorship and dissent in contemporary culture. I mean, Western you know, popular uh, media and political culture. So what conscience means today, a very kind of superficial dictionary definition. Just to start off, it's like an, an awareness of the moral dimensions of a situation, uh, along with an urge to pursue uh, the, what you judge to be the right course. So what is kind of what work in contemporary society? 
uh, Western society. Obviously, there are many things at work. I want to talk right now about the issue of censorship. So I believe there's a confusion in uh, contemporary censorship that should be brought into consideration. The grounds for censorship are obviously uh, conscience-based, so you would not censor something that you uh, find agreeable or, or morally correct. There's usually a criteria for censoring something uh, because it is problematic or offensive. And obviously, we've discussed uh, political reasons for censorship. At the same time, this conscience and oftentimes the ground for censorship are kind of shrouded in, uh, in fog. <laughs> it's not easy to identify what the grounds for censorship is in many situations. One example of an institution uh, here in the UK, actually, that uh, has come under scrutiny uh, re somewhat recently, the past few years, is uh, the National Union of Students. And so they have this thing called the no platform policy. And it, it was originally to um, deny platform to individuals they considered uh, fascists or racists or um, so from getting audience, right? This eventually included uh, people who, uh, who sympathize with some of these speakers as well. So um, the criteria is broader now for the no platform policy. It's, uh, it includes other things such as there's a specific ideology uh, in the National uh, Union of Students. And um, so individuals that are communicating, uh, one of their criteria now is like trans transphobia. So if you're suspected of being transphobic, no platform is going to come into effect and, and, and potentially censor you. This includes uh, even people in the in the gay community that happen to be under the suspicion uh, of, of being like transphobic or something like that. So the criteria is broader now. It's not just against fascists and racist groups. Whoa, not yet. Um, OK, so I guess the point I want to stress is it's not, it's not entirely clear uh, why um, how the, the criteria for censorship within, within NUS has, has evolved, okay? Because you're coming from fascists and racists to um, censoring people against like the gay, gay rights agenda or like uh, transgender issues, etc. So now I say you're not going to at least initially understand uh, the analogy I'm trying to make here. But, but there's, I believe there's a, a double standard of censorship at work. And it's actually more than a double standard. It's, it's not really clear why a lot of things are censored. And one of the things I want to shed light on is uh, the portrayal of women in advertisement uh, in our kind of contemporary world, uh, capitalist Western world. And not, I'm not an anti-capitalist by any means, but the, the so, et cetera. <laughs> um, so we, we see this, right? You, you walk around, you can see on the street, you see anywhere, and you see uh, a half-naked supermodel, uh, you know, every two street corners or something like this. Now I'm arguing that, that there's a similar reduction going on um, with, uh, with this portrayal because one of the grounds for censorship of the, the, the NUS does, for instance, is uh, with racism, you're kind of reducing an individual to racial qualities. Uh, fascism is obviously kind of imposing an ideology that would reduce the people under the government, et cetera. So I'm, su I'm trying to suggest that maybe this sort of portrayal has some of these qualities as well. And, um, and it's worth thinking about it. The first thing we see. Uh, the first thing seeing a half-naked supermodel communicates to us is uh, essential properties. It's, it's very lucrative to put uh, an image of a woman like this to sell, to sell products. And, and, uh, but what it's, th the fact that it's so pervasive and, 
is, 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 is doing a little bit more than just the co commercial things. It's, it's communicating to us that, um, that the central appeal of women is arguably the most important aspect that, that we are being communicated. So, and it's displayed indiscriminately. You see it everywhere. So I'm saying, I'm not saying sh this should be censored, but should there be a dialogue about the appropriateness of, uh, of something like this? Um, maybe not like outright censorship, but um, regulation as far as where it's displayed is, is anyone. And it seems to be an issue that would, ha would have concern, yet are the, where are the protests? You know, who cares? Who cares enough? And uh, I've not, I've done some preliminary investigations and uh, actually spoken to a lot, of, a lot of women. And it turns out a lot of women are actually uncomfortable with a lot of this projection, this, these sorts of advertisements. But, um, and there have been cases of, of even censorship of, of certain commercials or propaganda that are like a little over the top. But at the same time, we don't see, there is no censorship or, or, or a dialogue uh, trying to see if this is worth doing. So, um, and this, I'll get into more of this later, or what that means, right? Even if you disagree, but we don't really hear anything, especially not um, at the policy level, right? You can disagree, but it's just amazing how policymakers um, seem to be completely ignorant about the dimensions that, that some, an issue like this may have. It's very kind of thrown out. There's nothing. So there's another mixed standard, I think, that's, uh, that's similar, that, that jumps off of censorship, and this is uh, the issue of praise and blame. So Tayyip Erdogan, the Turkish incumbent prime minister, recently uh, said a statement uh, exhorting women to have more children said women should have at least three children. And, um, and he was attacked, uh, not physically, but, um, but he was attacked by uh, environmentalists, right? Babies are going to take over the world, consume our resources. Uh, many feminist groups, of course, had uh, strong issues with this. Um, it's not clear that he was putting women down, right? I mean, he, he actually gave an, his anecdote that he was uh, highlighting like the sacredness of maternity almost, and he gave it. He he said that I would uh, stoop down and kiss my mother's feet, for instance. So it's kind of like a different way of exalting women that people aren't really used to to hearing, right? So he was he was slammed for saying this. And yet, if you voice other views, um, you are a philanthropist. You are a progressive person. You are you're just you're just the guy, you know, that's doing things right. So um, I had another example from, from the U.S., but this is obviously Europe. But it's, 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 it's one figure who voiced uh, uh, basically views on traditional marriage, as personally speaking, uh, supporting traditional marriage. He wasn't even linking his business to this. And, and he was slammed because uh, a businessman has no, um, no, no business <laughs> talking about the nature of marriage. So, so they kind of censored him out. But you had other business billionaire tycoons signing a fat check for the you know, equal marriage movement. And, and these people were not censored, but they were, they were praised, praised, they were exalted. So it's kind of like there's confusion as far as, as censorship and as far as praise and blame, because the same grounds for censoring one are, are neglected when, when another speaks on the same thing. So then we have dissent, right? It's, it's part of our, of our form here. And uh, I think it's the off offspring of conscience. It's, it's posterior to conscience. With conscience, you, you, see, you assess a situation, and you have an urge to pursue what you believe is good or right. And uh, dissent is the next step. And ideally, well, not ideally, but dissent comes into play when there are obstacles to, to you carrying out or, or 
your your principles, living according to your principles, or, or if you're in a situation where uh, there's an entity constructing uh, your moral principles, you don't dissent where there's nothing to dissent to, you know? So there has to be, it's posterior in the sense that there has to be an obstacle that then pushes your conscience to come out. Um, so my friend talked about uh, Russia. So Boris Nemtsov recently got, uh, got killed, uh, 27th of February of this year. And he was um, uh, an activist in Russia, uh, pro-democracy, um, transparency, kind of advocating for freedom of corruption. But how <laughs> the Russian ideological kind of behemoth has developed, there's no room for a guy like this. Just uh, honestly speaking, uh, Boris Nemtsov was someone who was highly popular, very vocal, and um, it's not, for the US, for instance, or you know, with all their problems, you can have guys like this speaking. But when Russia's communicating such a strong image of themselves, uh, of, of kind of closing, uh, making their national identity a lot different from anyone else's, it's kind of hard to have a figure like this. So he was censored in the ultimate sense because he was killed. No? And uh, the Western world obviously cried out at Obama, um, David Cameron, and Francois Hollande. How do you say it? That guy? Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it, they were condemning the act, and, uh, but as far as we know, there's no, um, there's no culprit yet. So dissent is the offensive dissent, right? We, we're offending. Dissent, you offend uh, the entity you dissent to. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, I think you, you might have mentioned it, that, that the, when you're acting on conscience, the power, the power holders see it as an obstacle, and in a, in a way, it's an offense, right? So right here we have... And even you know the interests in Russia that are are placed. But we have everyone who dissents like this. It's offending someone. So dissenters are offenders. Um, so that's kind of it. I wanted to highlight that uh, these you know these three important things uh, that we get from contemporary kind of Western popular culture is that. Uh, the tenets of conscience, the grounds for censorship and praise and blame, they're not, they're not clear. It's not really clear. There's kind of this dichotomy going on. Um, some issues are given a lot more priority than others. And if we want to communicate transparency and freedom of opinion and all these things that, that people relish in when they talk about Western society, then as, as, as citizens, we really need to to exert personal eff efforts to, to, dis to discern uh, kind of what's going on uh, in, in uh, the ideology behind, um, behind censorship, and praise and blame, et cetera. It, it, society's not going to give us a conscience. We have, to, we have to do personal efforts. And the necessity of dissent is as relevant as ever. And it's, uh, in some cases, it's not as dramatic as Boris, uh, Boris Nemtsov, but, um, but there's still subtle, subtle things that, that we may, by raising awareness, uh, come to dissent too. So, dare to be offensive, guys. And, uh, all right. So. <laughs>
but still in Baltic states there is also quite fertile ground for Russia's influence because if you look the uh, Russian minorities living in Estonia and in Latvia they are 28% of whole population and 30% respectively in Latvia and in Estonia so this is still a constant threat for the territorial integrity of these countries they are under the protection of NATO but what we have witnessed in Ukraine was that Russia don't need to declare about the presence of their troops they can wage uh, hybrid war that means that it can still cause some clashes, riots, ethnic uh, movements, anti-governmental anti movements from Russian, uh, I mean, um, lead, leading by Russian minorities. So these countries are still a little concerned with how, how to deal with this problem. And in case of Ukraine, it happened and Ukraine had not enough security guarantees. And this is a topic uh, for us also, and I just wanted to say that this Eastern Partnership Program, which is the most kind of rigid and visible uh, kind of channel of cooperation with these countries, it should be contained also some security measures because our ties we are just unsecured. We had war in, back in 2008 uh, with Russia, and it was a mistake for Europe, and we believe so, that they renewed this business as usual after three months. And what was the result of this was Ukraine. And this is the same line. This is the same development. And uh, finally, th there is like more cooperation needed with these countries. And plus also after this event, after Ukraine, the West attention has been dramatically decreased. There is no resilience for more reforms. And uh, they are just the Western countries in the European Union is a standby regime. They are waiting how this conflict will end up, and uh, this is the really moment when we need the stronger support from the European Union because now we are not subjects in these relations. We became uh, sorry, we, we are not objects. We became subjects of relations between Russia and the European Union, and this everything is deciding between these two kind of powers. And no, not uh, nobody asks about that fate of this. Even we were expecting to get with a liberalization uh, um, um, kind of uh, allowance from this Riga summit, but Russia still now started to bargain with this uh, Minsk second agreement. And it says, okay, we temporarily stopped this uh, violation in Ukraine, but now if European Union decides to move forward and to intensify and enhance this uh, kind of connection to these countries, we can renew conflicts again. So we should be careful. And this is a real problem. We are staying on the second line of this wall. And um, I don't know how we sort of will end up, but as I described, there are really European principles and values under danger, not only we as a countries. Thank you. Okay, uh, another, another question regarding the, the, first, the first speaker. Could you say that what Russia is doing is m also to appease its own people. I mean, the Russians themselves are used to an empire, basically. All of their, all, almost all of their history, they have been in this massive empire that is almost constantly expanding. Couldn't it be that the Russians, after losing so much territory with the fall of the Soviet Union, their people felt kind of like the Germans after World War I, and Putin is trying to give that nationalism back to the people saying we will be great once again could it's you say that that is more more than just this political agenda putin's political agenda of personal conquest mm -hmm. it's a very right point thank you basically yes russian people even in the soviet union they felt as a dominant nation and they thought that the whole soviet system and so soviet space belonged to russians and now they are staying in, a, in a, and after collapse of Soviet Union, 25 million of Russians stayed outside of um, uh, Russia. This is a one reason why Putin named this uh, collapse of uh, Soviet Union as a catastrophe for, uh, for of the century, because so many Ru Russians are out of uh, um, Russia. But think is that yeah, they they have this this and this um, kind of uh, nationalism and this uh, grabbing of collecting of Russian lands which is a state ideology, and def defending the compatriots 
is a like, clear example of uh, nationalism. And uh, the thing is that this is supported by the uh, Russian people also. But if you are uh, like a dissenter and if you t are against of Putin, you can go to the European Union. And now I am taught by Russian um, professors who are the liberals and who are freed from their country. They decided to come in Estonia and Estonia is like one well, welcomes all, uh, all of the uh, people like this. But the thing is that like this, even this Ukrainian crisis and the uh, annexation of Crimea dramatically increased the rating of Putin. Every president of Put uh, Russia uh, came in power for, for with the name to give and uh, add something to Russia. And it was also Putin's kind of uh, tra it is tradition that, that each, each leader should uh, add some territory or something to Russia. And Putin made this, and it increased uh, its position, it, it became more like dominant, and it also prevented any dissent and any like um, suppressed by opponents. Because uh, now, uh, nowadays, 80% of uh, uh, Russians endorse this uh, idea of annexation of Crimea and the turning back this territory. Plus, there is no kind of uh, visible opponents who can uh, win over Putin for the upcoming elections. So, this is, this is how it happens. And uh, people are also kind of promoting this original idea of Putin. Can I exercise the chairman's privilege for a minute? I'll take a point. What do you th there are two questions that spring to mind when you're talking. Uh, one is, do you think that there's anything that the West did wrong or could do better? And secondly, we're talking about the EU a lot, but do you think Russia might be motivated by the US and China more mm. than by the EU? I know those are two separate questions. I know you had a, an observation, but if I could ask that yeah. first. Okay. Thank you. First of all, let's, let's start from the uh, second point about the America and the US. There are kind of uh, neorealist uh, visions and uh, orchestrated by, for instance, George Bush and Meshimer who claimed that Russia was provoked by the West and mainly by the US because of NATO enlargement, because of uh, this um, incorporation of Eastern countries. But there is a really still kind of uh, shortcomings of the, in this vision. The thing is that the last enlargement of NATO happened in 1999. And now it, is, uh, it was 2014, uh, last year, when Russia kind of reacted on it. So this is a really um, long uh, kind of uh, period between these two events. And also there was some kind of uh, periods be be between the relations with the US and Russia, then uh, there are like reset policy. And one of these was uh, during the uh, presidency of Medvedev. Then this person just uh, tried to renew and make uh, the relations with um, Russia, the US warmer, and they really did a great job regarding this um, start initiated new uh, kind of uh, armament programs in uh, um, uh, Europe. Uh, Russia became a member of uh, World uh, Trade Organization and so on. Many, many, many pro progress uh, they experienced during that time. But the thing is that um, the only thing that which is kind of really f threatening for Russia and the like uh, uh, alternative variable of uh, this event which happened in Ukraine was that Russia's uh, position and Putin's policy became less secure after this uh, dissemination of uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so social uh, networks. And during this presidency, third term of his presidency, it became more visible. And it is very difficult to explain that uh, expansion of NATO uh, really made the job. Because, and also, during the Yanukovych, who was the former president of uh, Ukraine, he had a clear position that uh, Ukraine would not become a member of NATO. So on this grounds, it's, it's a little bit unclear how it can be provoked by Russia or by US. Concerning the China, well, China is uh, kind of, I mean, um, they nowadays we are like uh, more co co partners than it was before Ukraine crisis because um, China remained as an alternative for Russia. But thing is that China is real emerging power, which is difficult to say about Russia. If you look um, military system, political system, economic system, this is not emerging power. Largely, this is decreasing power. And if we face again the bipolar system, 
in the future it will be China and uh, uh, US, but Russia will bend back on China. And they, they will be partners, but they are not equal partners. They will be part, like together, but against uh, the rest. But China, Russia will not be an like, independent actor in this um, realm, I guess. Thank you. Um, there was one question, and if we had a, a question too for... Uh, for yeah, so that will be the last question about Russia then. Uh, you told, tell, told that each leader should add something to Russia, but concerning Ukraine, cannot, cannot we talk about that they are trying to bring back what belongs to them? Because Ukraine always took a very important p part in Russia's political mind, and that is clear in their language, because when they talk about Ukraine, they are not talking about the country abroad, but they use a word that means the corner of our land. So maybe it's just a cultural thing and a cultural thought that we should get what belongs to us, to Russia. Yes, and the uh, thing is that Russia really added the territory of Crimea to the ter territory of Russia. So, uh, in your quick, to a quick response. But the thing is that this, this is really intertwined, and even in the beginning, and, the, and many people refer to this clash of, uh, between civilizations by Huntington. Mm -hmm. And also Huntington stipulated that there will be kind of uh, discrepancies in future between Ukraine and Russia. Because Ukraine is a country which has a kind of double um, uh, national system. In the western part we is more pro-European and uh, the, there is like, uh, how to say, uh, ideas more um, have, uh, prone to support the European Union. And in the eastern part it was populated mainly by Russians. And this was a kind of ethnic bomb which reacted and exploded last year. And uh, now, but this thing, thing is that they lived peacefully during the 23 years. But this was um, kind of supported by Russia, and if not Russia, this conflict would not have happened. The same applies to my country and Abkhazia and Georgia, which are occupied by Russia. We lived peacefully, but Russia found a great chance to make these uh, territories kind of split from the mainland and uh, even in case of Ukraine there is a uh, announcement by the um, um, I don't remember his, um, us, um, Primako, who was former foreign minister of uh, Russia and he said that it was a really it was not like a predefined or, or the planned a uh, long time ago they just saw the chance, and they seized this chance, and they grabbed this, uh, grabbed this uh, land from the mainland, from Iraq, from Ukraine. So everything is, was kind of spontaneous, uh, and uh, it developed, uh, fortunately, in a wrong way for, for Ukraine. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I have another question concerning of Russia. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, what do you think? Why why Russia uh, doesn't understand the fact, and why uh, doesn't want uh, to implement uh, the reforms, or why why doesn't Russia want to to be a uh, to be a, a fluent player in the in world economy? So it, I don't know investing in uh, in research and development, or or increasing the the competitiveness. And yeah. uh, from the other hand, uh, what do you think? Uh, what uh, should be a, a, a good uh, solution in this case? The cooperation or or the sanctions? Okay, um, it's a good question. First, first of all, um, I would like to also refer the previous my answers. And sometimes it is said that Russia was absolutely neglected from the construction of um, uh, post Cold War uh, European system and or security. But actually, there was the really a serious attempts from the European powers to include and incorporate Russia, but it decided absolutely differently because because of a kind of inferiority complex coming from Soviet Union. Russia don't want to be perceived as a kind of a nation state which is like how to say um, less than European Union as an act. Russia wants to be perceived as a great power. And uh, it still believes that even this Eastern Partnership can, uh, pro program, which was also offered by uh, the European Union to Russia, it refused to be part of this because it wanted equal relations. And it still always maintains the vision that whatever happens and what, uh, doesn't make sense what is the like, uh, actual 
um, idea of creating some new uh, kind of uh, formats for cooperation or, or relations. They want to be recognized as an equal partner for European Union. And concerning these reforms and democracy, we should uh, keep in mind that Russia consists of 21 in uh, independent, <coughs> previously being independent states, no, republic, sorry, and with <coughs> mainly the uh, Northern Caucasus. So democracy there would not be uh, like a precondition for collapse of this federation. Democracy there just does, doesn't work because democracy is not idea which could be constructed with vertical line. And Russia currently nowadays and Putin has kind of uh, dragons on these uh, republics who are uh, kind of um, friendly toward the central government because Russia is feeding them with this petrol money. And once this petrol money is exhausted, then nobody knows how Russia will uh, just uh, collapse and um, where these uh, publics will go. And in this way, this is a really strange that it can, uh, can uh, make reforms, but this reform was also failed in 1998 because of this, uh, this kind of uh, post-Cold War system was not coherent. There was many actors playing independently after the Cold War. And the power was uh, not concentrated. And this led into uh, the destruction of his reforms. And then Putin came in power, who became and who made the uh, Russia stronger. And uh, this uh, strong Russia implies restoration of its uh, great power status. Yeah, okay, uh, if we are looking, for example, China, we can we cannot talk about fully democracy. So, but uh, China is a, is a huge player in the in the world economy. So, for example, Brazil, India, China became uh, became uh, relevant players in the in the world play field uh, in the in the last decades. And uh, for example, Russia, why want this uh, true violence, not true natural <coughs> development? First of all, I would say that Russia is a really serious actor as a, as a like trading actor because um, it holds the richest oil resources, and you, um, that's why this is so important for the European Union. But to compare uh, China, which has a position of uh, peaceful rise, this is not absolutely different from uh, Russia's position because, as as we can see. Nowadays, Russia is growing and uh, it tries to uh, destroy this status quo as much as possible. It, uh, it is just geopolitical nihilism, which is difficult to say about uh, China or India. It tries to undermine the system around him, but doesn't care about consequences, what will be after this. Um. Could I exercise again some German's privilege? Is your question about Russia or about censorship? Yes. Does anyone have a question about censorship? Yes. Um, what I'll do is I'll take two on censorship and then come back okay. to Russia, if that's all right with you, too. Okay. I, 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 I don't want you to be left out. <laughs> yeah, um, I have a question about censorship. Um, you mentioned early on in your presentation about the Victoria's Secret models and uh, how women aren't very fond of seeing the pictures everywhere on the streets, <coughs> and you were also talking about the placement of those um, of those advertisements or those commercials in a way. Uh, how do you feel about the um, the false portrayals, which are often used in uh, commercials, uh, which often involve things such as Photoshop, which give a wrong image about how the women portrayed really are or how products function, but they might not function as they actually say they do. Um, and there are movements, of course, which try to counteract this. Um, they portray a certain uh, form of conscience, in a way, and they descend towards this idea of commercials. And how do you, I was just wondering what your views were concerning the false portrayal. Yes, uh, no, that's actually very, very relevant and very relieved because you, I mean, you introduced the notion of uh, commercial, commercialization, right, of these mm -hmm. things. As far as, uh, and I wouldn't see directly the link between products and what I mentioned, but it's making more sense. I mean, if you have, um, 
photoshopped or to make women look better, etc. But uh, the thing is, what what some of this is doing, it's exactly doing that. It's a commercialization of of uh, of. I mean, the beauty of women is obviously something good. I mean, that's great. You know, women are beautiful. But this sort of advertising is exactly it's commercializing this. So it's it's giving you the best part of uh, of what a woman's supposed to look like, right? You know, you, the best uh, product you see, as it were. You know, you see a product advertised. You're not going to see a product that, that that doesn't look good. Um, and and I think it's exactly doing that on on m multiple levels. Uh, number one, it it um. It's 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 affecting a, a reduction of what it of what it means to be a woman. The first thing you're communicated in in these sorts of media is that uh, is the sensual properties. It means when I see woman, number one is the her sensual properties. Number two is everything else. This is what this sort of advertisement does. So it, what I was doing it an example of censorship is that. A lot of these organizations that seem to censor certain views or like the no platform and they don't give a, a, a giving audience to certain figures with certain views, the argument is that certain groups are being attacked, they're being compromised, they're, they're being reduced. So, uh, so therefore, we sh it's bad to do this. We should not have them here. We should not let them speak. Um, what I'm trying, and they're, they're, this is not the only example. What, what I'm trying to say is that that the we've gotten so used to this sorts of advertisement. It seems so normal to us to see a woman that's almost naked, uh, every street pretty much in in most uh, commercial Western countries, and uh, and and maybe this is not as as natural as 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 what we've become accustomed to, um, and maybe. Uh, and if it falls under some of those same categories, if it is reducing a group, if it is commercializing a group, right, then, then where is the... Is anyone complaining about this? Now, I mentioned at the grassroots level, it turns out a lot of women, even non-religious women, etc., do take issue with some of these things. But at the same time, and the question that's relevant uh, to Professor Martin that was asked, uh, whether more direct democracy, if local democracy is good, we need some of that. If you, it's not enough to disagree, and we need to talk to to policymakers because policymakers, these people have no clue that 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 they don't hear my argument for the reductivism of, of such advert. They have no clue. So it makes money. It sells. This is the part of the world. This is part of the world today. Let's have these advertisements everywhere. No, it's not going to change unless people go and make a case for it. You see what I'm saying? That, no. That's the thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm one one quick final call. I think one of the biggest problems with uh, these type of commercials and these type of other type of advertisements are uh, is the fact that uh, women or any other con uh, controversial aspect are used as tools. Like they are indeed reduced to something which they can be used to sell a certain product, which is very problematic in and of itself. Um. <coughs> yeah, how I understood your reasoning is that um, that everyone like that there's a certain social uh, so, yeah, social norm right now which has like which has like a like a room for half naked women but not for dissenting ideas in political or ethnical issues. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. my question is now like you have these social norms which are really dominant in almost every society and you have conscience. How does these two work together? <laughs> no, that's that's great. I mean, it's part of what I wanted to illustrate is that um, that we we cannot depend on 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 just uh, popular the values we've been communicated through through at least popular society through the media through what we see in the news through uh, through marketing etc. We're not going to be we're not going to be given a conscience there. We're going to be given that. We're going to be given that that it's a it's a social norm that this is okay. And even people that would think this is not okay are just being told it's okay every day that, that they think it's okay, you know? And, uh, and right, there's, there's this issue of why, why are some of these um, platforms of, if you say racism or anything that's perceived as sexist, that's like, that's taboo, right? When we have a, other phenomenons that may be equally problematic that no one cares about. I mean, where does conscience come in? I think, I think my exhortation is we, everyone has, to, you, personal efforts are required. 
we have to be aware that that there is a, some the kind of a double standard going on in how things are run. I'm not saying someone deliberately is is doing, but at least culturally, there's there's a sort of inconsistency with what's happening. So that calls on us. Uh, especially, I mean, people say the young all the time, but yeah, I mean, that calls on us in a way to, we really have to try to be aware and, and I don't know if read, but be informed of, of where are these principles coming from? How consistent are they? Even if, I'm not saying they're right or wrong, but if you're, if you're censoring someone for saying something, why are you not censoring the other guy? Even if you disagree with him, right? Just question, what is at work? And, and so I, I believe that, um, that it's just it's per, per, a lot of people have to, to have to do their own effort because you're not, and it's not just it's not enough to disagree. You see, because the the dissenters we look at, it's like um, how much how much do I disagree to the point where I'm willing to risk something? Right? We have uh, 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 Boris Nemkov or all these other figures, and these are obviously like highlight figures because this is a, a, an issue that's a lot more subtle. You're not you're not risking yourself being killed in Russia by advocating for democracy, but you are risking other things. You're risking being unpopular. You're risking certain views that that go against something that's perfectly acceptable. You, oh, that's not maybe that's not like good for women to be portrayed that way. What? That's kind of how it is, and and guys like it, and then and then it makes money. So 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 there it is. So it's it's um I think it, it's you have to be willing to risk a little something. It's not enough to just disagree. You can't you can't just leave it in here. Because so, nothing's going to get done, you know, if it's just there. But before I take a question from the floor, which I will, if I can make a personal observation, just chairman there, I think we're both connected here in that we have a tremendous um, uh, power now for, of advertising and media manipulation. And it's very easy to get people thinking that they think things that other people want them to think uh, and not to think things through. <laughs> you can think a lot there. But, uh, for instance, there's that tangled question of Russian sanctions. Uh, the ruble, I think, has appreciated 18% since the sanctions, because the sanctions that we imposed were rather good ones, and the sanctions we could have imposed for Russia. And the sanctions we could have imposed that would have been bad for Russia, we didn't. So, you know, the, the, uh, we've actually encouraged Russian domestic investment, we've encouraged gold purchases, and we've encouraged the ruble to appreciate, but we haven't taken <coughs> sanctions, uh, properly speaking, against energy policy or against the banking system, um, possibly because of our own involvement with them. Most people wouldn't have thought that through. Similarly with uh, advertising, there's this tremendous weight of advertising, and you can look at study after study, wherever Western advertising or uh, what you might call Atlantic advertising goes in, people's health changes, uh, people's self-image changes, people's bodies' image change. Um, there's that famous study of Indian private schools which develop Western advertising signs outside of them on a Monday and anorexia on a Friday. You know, there's, so thinking for yourself, thinking things through, is probably the only grit, the, the grit in the machine. And trying to make things as small as possible and as subsidiary as possible might be a way <coughs> of speaking truth to power here. But it's just an observation. And I'm conscious I'm taking this over and shouldn't be. You had a question? Yes. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your speech. It was really interesting. I don't have actually a question, but a remark on... You talked about the thing that who cares now about women and the censorship and all these things. Um, my point of view is that the majority of women do care about um, seeing their face and body being promoted and uh, you know illustrated in magazines and all this stuff. But their voice isn't loud enough to um, stop the fact or even um, eliminate it. So um, the. The truth is that uh, mentalities and notions are deeply rooted in to civilian society. So uh, my suggestions are... In what society, sorry? In civilian society, in, society. in social. Um, my suggestion is that we should uh, first think about <coughs> changes the mentalities and the notions, then educate it, uh, then raise awareness, and then talk about and think about the regulations and policy makers. Just this. Have a discussion. Sorry, you had any it's about the second presentation. Yeah, uh, you said that <clears throat> we should have a dialogue concern based on uh, censorship. So, my question is uh, quite philosophical. <laughs> um, should we have a dialogue in order to see whether something is moral or immoral, immoral in order to censorship or not? And 
is this moral? I mean, is this moral to have a dialogue in order to see what is moral? <laughs> okay, that's good. No, I can answer, but yes, go ahead. Can I can I, think more. I, I actually, just think. What do you think of that question in regards to Russian policy? Can we have a moral approach to foreign policy? And can, and can we think about moral foreign policy or not? This and I will come back. Yes, to yeah, this is a really right point. And when I mentioned post sovereign for postmodern entity and modern entity. And the main point of postmodern uh, kind of uh, entity as our opinion is an ethic in international relations. And Russia doesn't follow any moral or, uh, or any ethic to in its uh, foreign relations because it's, it's still persists that there is no kind of um, space for morality as Ma Makiewicz was saying, but Makiewicz was saying not so, not so like uh, as a straightforward, he was, he was saying that uh, there is a different moral. But for Russia, this moral is perceived through the realist prism also, and it remains in, 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 entrenched in this like, realist moral, and which is really dangerous for the rest of the um, kind of world. But the thing is that European Union, as a postmodern uh, entity, is much advanced than the rest of the world. That's why, nowadays, the European Union is totally disconnected from Russia and from the uh, enabled great powers, because of its such a high level of advancement. And um, it creates a problems and conundrums, because the rest of the uh, kind of countries can catch up with this, uh, the, like, uh, pace of development and it creates these uh, clashes among them and uh, I don't know who will win finally but uh, I wish European Union would win and the rest of the space will, will, will countries would follow this uh, ethical foreign policy. Uh, the same question about morality. Yeah. Um, so to address your point first uh, really quickly, um, education and awareness um, and, and you're saying, you kind of suggest that this this comes before trying to take it to the policy level, right? Kind of raising this awareness. And it's, it's kind of a complicated to see 